over a barrel continues. There are more than 160,000 miles of oil pipelines crisscrossing the United States. The oil inside them oozes its way along at about five miles an hour through this intricate maze. America runs on oil. The U.S. economy stands on top of a foundation of oil and natural gas pipelines. Daniel Jurgen, who wrote the definitive book on the oil industry, The Prize, went with us to the crossroads of oil in America, the former oil boom town of Cushing, Oklahoma. Why of Cushing, Oklahoma? In 1912, an oil man found oil, and within three years, you had this incredible boom. Cushing was producing about almost 20% of the U.S. Uh, oil at that time. Wells sprang up everywhere. People flocked from all over the country to cash in on the oil boom. It grew very fast, and so they had to build a lot of pipelines. The oil under Cushing finally ran out, but the storage tanks and pipelines remain. Today, it's here in Cushing, where the ownership of the oil legally changes hands, that the price is set. But when I'm on the air at night quoting the price of oil, it's the oil flowing through these pipes at that point, That's right? right? Everybody is using that as their reference price for this global marketplace. It's this oil that is that, is that price every night. While the oil may be in Cushing, the market is here. This is the NYMEX, the New York Mercantile Exchange, where the deals to buy and sell oil by the millions of barrels are struck. And many contend that all that yelling and screaming, all that caterwauling and chaos, was responsible for $4 a gallon gas last summer. Not just supply and demand, but also speculation right here at the NYMEX. The public outcry over rising gas prices was so great that Congress held hearings to investigate, and a prominent trader named Michael Masters came forward to blow the whistle on what he said was really going on at the NYMEX. Uh, you have asked the question, are institutional investors contributing to energy price inflation? And my unequivocal answer is yes. Masters explained how the NYMEX was originally set up for airlines and refineries and trucking companies and other industries to lock in long-term fuel prices. But the trading floor had been taken over by speculators as prices began creeping up last year. There were many people talking about $200 oil and higher prices. So pension funds, institutional investors of different stripes, decided that crude oil and other commodities were a place w in which they could invest. It's just like someone would do with a stock or a bond. As a way to make money. As a way to make money. And they were betting that the price would continue to go up. They were betting that the price would continue to go up, using crude as an instrument for speculation. Some financial institutions went one step further, actually taking possession of millions of barrels of oil and storing it in tank farms like gold bars in a safety deposit box, hoping the oil would go up in value. And I guess their calculation is, can I make more by holding the oil and moving it into a higher priced market later? Steve Worry's company leases out many of the storage tanks in Cushing. We hear that there are financial entities, uh, 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 investment banks, etc., that are actually in this business. Sure, there are. There are the companies that you talked about that really look to, uh, to, uh, to, to play the oil game and look at ways of getting, uh, getting a profit by buying, uh, buying low and selling high. At the height of the speculation bubble, about a quarter of the oil in Cushing was owned by Wall Street investment banks. At the same time, analysts at those banks publicly predicted that the price of oil would hit record highs. And when it did, the investment banks made a lot of money. There are Wall Street major organizations like uh, Morgan Stanley, like Goldman Sachs, who themselves own storage facilities. Why are they in that business? It gives them an advantage because they can buy physical oil from the fu futures markets, take delivery, and hold it in their own pipelines or their own storage facilities. If you have a large enough presence and you store enough oil, that you can have an effect on the price. Do you call that manipulation? Do you, do you, what, you, know, do you call that... You know, what, what, what's the word for that? I'm not sure, but it's something that I think that, that the government should look at very seriously. If that's not manipulation, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, isn't it a duck? It certainly could be, but there's no rules against that. There's no rule against it because of a host of regulatory changes made in Washington a decade ago. This law is what concerns masters and others the most. 
it lifted restrictions on the amount of oil futures contracts any investor could hold. In effect, inviting speculators to start placing big bets. All of these people are simply swapping, uh, transacting oil, so that a barrel of oil may change hands 30 times from the time it comes out of the ground to the time it gets in into your tank. You can see everyone who put their fingers in there wanted a profit. So profit on profit on profit on profit, and who gets stuck? The American consumer and our economy. Earlier this month, the White House announced it intends to impose new rules that it says will curtail speculation on the oil market. The next day, the price of oil in Cushing fell 4%. There's one other thing that should be mentioned about America's oil pipelines. They are vulnerable. This document, for example, comes from Al-Qaeda and calls for waging economic jihad by attacking the U.S. economy at its most vulnerable point, where the oil flows. When there are, are uh, bad actors around like Al-Qaeda, we have to be very aware of this. As Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu is the man in charge of America's oil security. An Al-Qaeda pamphlet said these are very soft targets, in a sense promoting them as a target for, for attack. Do you have concerns about it? Yes, I have concerns about it. Because a disruption in the oil pipelines in this country would have catastrophic effects in price. You know, energy has become such an integral part of developed countries' lives uh, that these suppliers of energy, the electricity, the oil, the gas, uh, are ways of di disrupting society in a very significant way. Intelligence sources say they know of no al-Qaeda plots targeting pipelines in the U.S. at this point. But this man meant to do just that. These explosives were supposed to blow up part of the Alaskan oil pipeline. The man behind the plot was a Canadian anarchist named Alfred Rumeyer. He's the man in the white hat talking to a confidential informant. They don't know where it's coming. They don't know when it's coming. They don't know if it's coming. Um, His motivation, which he laid out in an 88-page manifesto, was to disrupt the U.S. economy. But he had a second motive as well to take advantage of the tight oil market and get rich off of oil futures. He wanted to make money, and he wanted to make a lot of money. He mentioned to the confidential informant, I believe, making the figure of something like $20 million. And the way he was going to do that was to buy some oil futures. The price of those things is going to go way up. Buy low, put some holes in the pipeline so that the, the oil from the north slope of Alaska would not be available, cause a spike in the price of oil, and then sell what he had bought low, very high. Rumeyer got caught and is spending 13 years in prison. But Rumeyer's plot, threats from terrorists, even perfectly legal financial trading, are all examples of how vulnerable the American economy is to the price of oil. The United States government estimates that by 2025, Americans will use 37% more oil than is used now. When we come back... We don't pay an honest price for the energy we use in America. I think that people look at the Middle East differently if they had to pay for the wars we're fighting there every time they pump gasoline. Over a Barrel returns after this.